Hey guys, this is our lecture on probabilities and research. Um, it's broken up into three parts, and this first part is really about ways in which we sample a population, what are some of the risks and rewards associated with those various sampling techniques. Um, so let, let's go ahead and get started. So this is going to be a little bit of um, the slide and the next one. They're opposite sides of the same coin, so it may seem like a, a tad bit of overlap. I always like this quote. Um, it's a good way of starting. It, almost everything worth studying requires a sample. kind of means that if something's worth studying, it's probably a large enough question that it pertains to a large enough population that it would be almost impossible to study that entire population and therefore absolutely require a sample. Now, because a sample is not studying everybody, there will always be some risk, right? If your sample, for example, is not representative of that population. If I ask only people in Florida how they view about a political issue, and then I say this is how the country feels, well, that sample might not represent that larger population. And the problem sometimes with sampling is that we don't always know that's the case. So we might not know that that sample is misleading if we believe it to be representative. And this can lead, of course, then to inaccurate conclusions. We might make bad decisions based on this information. Um, and so sampling is very, very important, although it does, of course, come with some risks. Now, some practical examples of sampling. So I used to joke um, that on the very first day of class, whenever I taught, and my advisor used to do this as well, so I think I got it from him, I would deliver a sort of fire and brimstone lecture. That is, I would go over the syllabus discussing how difficult the class was going to be, how challenging some of the assignments were likely to be, and how, although I personally would work with you and was a nice individual, um, you were going to be challenged. Now, the goal of that lecture was to try and frighten away, potentially, some of the students who weren't going to be willing to do what extra work might be required to get a high grade in that class. And so in many ways, I was trying to bias and give a non-representative sample. That is, I'm not really the professor from Animal House who writes Satan on the chalkboard. I'm, I'm generally speaking a pretty good guy, but I try and give that misrepresentative sample. And because students don't really know that that's not representative of me, that's one of the risks in doing that, right? Taking a class, going to the first day, and assuming that first day represents what that class or that professor's style is going to be like. Now, similarly, you, you might risk um, uh, sampling in, in sort of everyday activities like, say, cooking. Right? And so my, my wife's a huge fan of soup. And so several days a week, she is making soup, and oftentimes from scratch, not just the miso that, that's sort of a daily staple, but a full broth prepared from vegetables cooked down. And, and so let's say she's making this soup, and it's been boiling on the oven for a little while, and maybe she's been downstairs recording or teaching violin, and she goes up and wants to know whether or not the soup is ready, whether or not the soup tastes good. So she takes a spoon, puts it right in the top, skims off the top, takes a sip. Is the skimmed off top? going to taste like the rest of the soup? If she plunges all the way to the bottom and doesn't stir it up at all and gets just from there, is that the most representative taste of the soup? No, I mean, a lot like the daily miso, in order for it to taste right, in order to get a representative sample, you have to sort of mix it up, right? And so sampling always requires some knowledge of how your sample is obtained in order to really think about how representative it might be to that larger population. Now, assuming we sample correctly, and that's the point of this lecture here, is to talk about how we sample correctly. Well, then we can be sure that that sample represents that larger population. So we can have greater confidence in any findings that we come to. Our conclusions, then, about the population are reached at a fairly low cost, right, because we sampled instead of studying that whole population. But because we're sampling, because we knew we took certain techniques to ensure it was representative, we also remain open-minded about the fact that it might still not be perfectly representative of that population. So even though we have more confidence in our conclusions, we have that same, I guess, healthy degree of scientific skepticism or cynicism that allows us to sort of keep an open mind. And, and ultimately sampling then, um, properly sampling, will lead to making wiser decisions based on that available evidence, right? Scientific-based decision-making, something that we have all missed in the last four years of, of government administration. So we've already talked a little bit about sampling, right? In the very, very first lecture, um, I talked to you about Dr. John Snow. I showed you a little video about how he attempted to um, diagnose and, and then eventually um, stop the, the cholera outbreak in London and, and, in fact, opened up the, the field for epidemiology, right? The field we, we know to be super important right now today. Um, what he did was he wandered around, presumably with a clipboard or something like it, and interviewed 
a bunch of potential victims or um, neighbors, loved ones, relatives, friends of those victims and simply tried to figure out what he could about their lives, what led to their death, what sorts of things had they been involved in just prior to their death. And then he tried to look across them right, and found that there was almost no similarity in any of their actions, any of the places they had been. The only real similarity seemed to be that they all live in this neighborhood and the closer you live to that pump, the greater degree of your, I guess, probability to have contracted cholera or have somebody in your house contract cholera. And what was really important here was that Jon Snow did not just look at one block. He didn't just look at one apartment building and ask everybody in there. Instead, he went to a large area surrounding where the outbreak seemed to be taking place in an attempt to be sure that he had some generalizability, that that sample was representative of all of the people in London and not just the people that, say, worked at the brewery. If he had only interviewed people at the brewery, he'd find that almost nobody had contracted cholera. In fact, virtually nobody contracted cholera at the brewery because they were allowed to drink beer instead of the local water. So, hey, hey beer saves lives. Um, okay, so the real importance of sampling, right? Generalizability, having that strong external validity to say that my sample does look like the population, and therefore my conclusions about a sample still apply to the population the whole damn point of statistics and experimentation, right? So we need to make sure we do it right. That being said, you've got a lot of flexibility depending on what you need, right? How you need your participants. The, the best, 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 best way, right? The ideal is true random sampling. According to true random sampling, every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected into the study. Right? So that's ideal because it means there's zero influencing what determines whether someone is in your study. It's entirely random, it's entire, entirely chance. You can't end up with biased samples where they're all male or they're all Asian or they're all whatever demographic variable, right? The problem though, is that this is extremely difficult to do. So what population of interest am I studying in my own personal research? So one of the things I look at is unconscious plagiarism. In unconscious plagiarism research, we just look to see whether people accidentally plagiarize without knowing it. The population I'm really trying to describe here is human beings. All human beings, how their memory works and why they might engage in unconscious plagiarism. So my population then is a, you know, about an 8 billion strong population. So can I engage in true random sampling? When I gather my participants, is it possible for me to give every member of the human population an equal chance of being selected into the study. Let's say I eliminate anybody under 18. I'm just looking at adults now. And I eliminate anybody over 65. We're still looking at billions of people, right? It's not possible. I can't account for all of them. I couldn't possibly put them in a list in order to randomly select them for participation in my study. So instead, we use forms of things like convenience sampling. In convenience sampling, I might randomly select from the individuals that are conveniently located, oftentimes physically near me. And so one form of convenience sampling, though the IRB at UM Dearborn doesn't like to hear this, is the subject pool. The subject pool that psychologists at UM Dearborn use and that all, most universities use in order to get the research participants for their studies. You guys might know this, you might have taken an intro here and you had to participate in a number of research studies as part of your research appreciation requirement. Um, if you did that, then researchers selected you through a form of convenience sampling where everybody who agreed to be in the pool because they were conveniently located near us, we now randomly select from within that pool. Actually, we do a form of self-selection. You read the study and you say, hey, I want to be in that study, and you sign up. Some minor issues with that, as we'll see in a second, but these are the two primary forms of sampling that we see. The true, ideal, best way is random sampling. The way we still sometimes do it, frequently do it, and practice is convenience sampling. And as long as some of that randomness still stays in place, we can have reasonable confidence that we are still representing that larger population. Now, samples, of course, can be biased. They can be biased through the um, sort of random luck, right, where you got bit by randomness, and you happen to be the one very, very unusual case where you ended up with a very biased, non-representative sample, even though you selected it truly randomly. Uh, testimonials are a good example of biased samples, right? Nobody's going to put a negative testimonial on their website. My, my wife's a violin instructor, right? She tries to advertise her, her services to a whole range of students. And one of the ways she does this is on her website, this rachelsmusicgarden.com, she's got this testimonials section, right? 
she's probably not going to find some student who was never really all that great a student and didn't practice and probably didn't have a great experience and then put their review and testimony along there. Hell, she probably doesn't even stay in touch with those sorts of students. Instead, she has this army of current and former students who really love her. And so she grabs those testimonials. She puts those on there. Now, I can personally attest to those testimonials being a perfectly accurate representation of her abilities and personality, but... That being said, a lot of testimonials do show some bias, and it's important to think that when you're reading a review, you're reading a testimonial, what you're trying to do inherently is get a sample. You want to read a couple of people's opinions, and hopefully they represent what everybody's opinion would be like, and thus what your opinion would be like before you make that next step. Right? So keep in mind that testimonials, reviews, are oftentimes frequently biased. Um, these are obviously two made-up ones that I, that I grabbed about a Turnitin plagiarism checking website. But they sort of give an example about how most of the time when people write reviews, when people give testimonials, it's because they're very strongly opinionated towards one end or the other. Um, products, uh, producers, advertisers, they pick the positive testimonials, right? Not, not the negative ones to display to you. So how do we then avoid this sort of bias in samples? How do we try and keep things as close to random as possible? Humans are not good at being random. Okay, I even have a, a task that I ask people to do sometimes in my lab called random number generation. And we have to tell them over and over again to stop generating predictable sequences. Because as they're doing other tasks, they get distracted and they start saying 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3. That's not random. So to ensure randomness, right, or, or to better approximate randomness, what you can do is actually use what's called a random number table. So your book has one in the back, but you can find them online. They are simply big tables like this one filled with numbers, okay? Um, what you can then do with it, and you have to come up with a strategy ahead of time, um, is basically use the numbers in the table to pick your participants. So let's say, for example, I might want to measure satisfaction or happiness among undergraduates enrolled in a psychology statistics course. So I want to give you guys um, some sort of survey, all the people in, in enrolled in stats this semester and see how happy they are, how satisfied they are with their stats class. But I don't want to study everybody. <clears throat> there's 30 people in my class and I think there's two or three other sections. So we're looking at 90 or 120 participants in all and that's a lot to be studying right now. I want to study 30 of them. So what I could do then is take all 120 participants, all 120 students that we have, assign them all a number. So I'm not looking at their names, I'm not worried about it. It's just 001 all the way to 120, right? Three digit numbers representing all 120 people. Then what I can do is just start somewhere in the table. I right? pick a random spot. I'm just going to start in the top left, right? For where it starts with a zero. And then I look to the first three digits 044. Four. That means participant 44, whoever the hell they are, ask them to be in the study. Move to the next one. The next three are 935. 935 is well past our 120. Skip it. Keep moving across the table, and random number tables are huge, until you have selected whatever number of participants you want to study, usually 25 to 30. Right? And so however you use the random number table, it is important that you think about how you're going to use it beforehand. If instead you start using it while you're, you're sort of coming up with how to use it, you do have the probability or at least possibility of inserting some of your own biases. You know, you really wanted this participant or these participants to be selected, and so you pick a way without noticing it that does sort of bias the, the likelihood of them being selected or, or others being selected out. So this, I guess, kind of highlights the, the difference between the true ideal of randomness, right, and what we'll call later random assignment as well instead of just random selection, and the sort of shortcut approximations we use to um, try and get at the same level of randomness in, in sort of practice that we desire in theory, right? What we might call quasi-random designs or quasi-random sampling. Another way to gather participants is through two sort of related methods called cluster and stratified sampling. Both identify a way of grabbing groups or individuals from, from groups that already exist in your population as a way of getting a representative sample that doesn't involve the entire population. So let's say, for example, you wanted to measure the average uh, body mass index for the state of Michigan, right? So you want the BMI of all adults in Michigan. Obviously, studying everybody in all of Michigan is not practical. Cluster sampling technique would identify existing clusters within this population, so perhaps geographic regions. So let, let's get rid of 
the UP because come on, there's not that many people up there anyway. So we focus down here on the on the lower peninsula, and we can just largely divide it into four regions: northern Michigan, western Michigan, central mid Michigan, and our favorite part down here of southeastern Michigan, where it's warm and sunny all the time because we're in the southeast, right? <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, so if we have these four, those four clusters that exist out there, cluster sampling would randomly pick a number of clusters. So in the graphic here below, it's picking two. Randomly selects two clusters. Group one, group four, let's take the color coding and say that they picked central mid-Michigan and western Michigan. That was random. That brings in the random between one and selection. Because we're only studying two clusters, we're going to study everybody in them. So we're going to go and study everybody we can in central and in Michigan and everybody that we can in western Michigan. Because we study those whole clusters, we're going to use that data to make some assumptions, some conclusions about the entire state of Michigan and the clusters that remained unstudied. Sorry, dogs are playing. Another method of selecting is used, uh, is called stratified sampling. So stratified sampling also relies on some existing strata or levels that exist within um, a population. So maybe I wanted to measure the GPA of college athletes, right? Uh, college athletes can still be freshmen, sophomores, juniors, or seniors, and that, that may affect how they're re related to their, or excuse me, may affect the relationship between GPA and them being a college athlete. And so in stratified sampling, instead of picking a random set of strata and studying everybody within them, stratified sampling uses that level, that variable that's a nominal, whatever creates the strata, in this case, uh, year in school, right, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and it selects the, a random number of participants from each of those levels. So you might say, Take 20 freshmen, 20 sophomore, 20 junior, 20 seniors. They're selected randomly from those strata, so they still should be representative of the larger strata. And what you've done is now studied all four areas to make sure you've studied a fully representative sample of that population, but done so at a much lower cost than studying all of them. Okay, so cluster stratified sampling. I, another way of looking at it is sort of this graphic, right? Stratified sampling, so we switch here. Um, stratified sampling over here on the left, you're going to grab a random number of people from each of the strata. So every one of those rectangles, I grab two browns, three blues, two magentas, three greens, whatever, right? In cluster sampling, I've got those six clusters, those six groups or rectangles. I'm going to pick a random number of clusters. So let's say these two are the ones I'm going to be picking. And I study every individual in those clusters. Okay? Both greatly reduce the number of people that have to be overall studied. Um, so there's two more graphics. I find the cluster and stratified sampling tend to get a little bit confused. Um, so another one, Remember cluster sampling. In cluster sampling, you identify which clusters. So in John Snow's example, he might have had 25 streets he could study. He said, okay, I'm going to study these five streets, and I'm going to study everybody on those five streets. And I'm going to hope that those five streets then tell me about the other 20 that I didn't study. Okay. In stratified sampling, instead, he might have said, I'm going to go to each street, but I'm going to randomly select two houses to go to on each street. Right? In each case, you greatly reduce the number of individuals you have to study, you maintain some level of random selection, and thus hopefully maintain some level of representativeness of that larger population. Something that's a little bit like what we do in the um, psychology department and what many individuals end up doing for research is called a volunteer sample. Now, we have to be careful about where we go to get our participants to avoid the kind of bias that can occur in volunteer sampling. Because you might imagine that in some research studies, the kind of participants you recruit would not necessarily be representative of the larger population. So let's say I, I wanted to see how the average individual responded to marijuana, right? Or responded to pornographic materials. And so I place an ad in, in a paper or in a, in a college advertisement on, on a research bulletin board that says, we need participants willing to consume marijuana and be observed, you know, for the next hour. Or we need participants to watch pornographic materials while we monitor their physiological or physical responses. The individuals who choose to participate in those studies may be different from the larger population, right? They may be sort of a subsample. It may be, in the first case, people who are already prone to smoking marijuana and think, why not? I like to do it. I'll go to this study and then offer my services for observation, right? 
In the other case, people who are uncomfortable watching pornography are probably not going to sign up for that study, and it's only the people who are comfortable with that. So again, volunteer samples come with this risk that the volunteers themselves are a little bit weird, and they're not like the rest of the population, and that's why they're volunteering for this study. One of the best ways is after we've selected them through whatever method you find to be the best for your research, right? whether it's true random selection or some of the approximations of that, the next thing we need to do is ensure that the people we selected to be in the study are not placed into the experimental conditions, the groups, in any biased way. And so the way in which we assure this is through what's called a randomized block design. So in a randomized block design, you first grab these participants that are relatively homogenous, right? They all look the same. Or in fact, we can do what's called matching, where we look for certain important variables like gender, let's say, if we want each group to have an equal male-female composition. So if it's 50-50 males in group one, we want it 50-50 males in group two. Well, then what we can do is identify by gender ahead of time and then randomly select from that larger sample that we had a number of males for this one, a number of males for this one, a number of females, a number of females. Then they can continue with our experimental conditions. This ensures that the makeup of those groups is not biased in any way, in the same way we might expect if we had a sort of non representative sample, right? The whole goal here is so that later on, the, the end game of, of science, right, is to ensure some ability to replicate so we can learn something about nature, whether it's human nature, nature around us. And so taking these practices, ensuring representative samples, randomized block design so we have random assignment to our individual conditions, ensures that we can have greater confidence in those findings. It ensures that others that go to replicate those findings are more likely to replicate them because we did things properly the first time. And so although these seem like very, very simplistic things to do and, and very obvious things to do, they're extremely important to the scientific process itself. That being said, just because you can't randomly select or even randomly assign a participant for some particular research question doesn't mean it's not an important research question. So let's say you were curious whether or not individuals who went through um, somewhat oppressive communist regimes um, and then were able to defect from those regimes, so to escape those regimes to some extent, if they were more likely or less likely to engage in some form of political or social activism. Okay, kind of a cool social kind of question here. But how do you engage in random selection and random assignment here? You can't randomly select which, you know, defectors you're going to study because there aren't that many of them. Not too many people are able to defect, so you probably are going to study anybody you can talk to. It might be two people, it might be seven people, but you couldn't randomly select from that sample. You also couldn't randomly select from a larger population who became a defector and who didn't become a defector to see whether or not there was just some pure thing that led to defectors versus activism, and not that you were maybe already kind of a political activist and that's why you defected and that's why when you got out you led to activism. So random selection simply isn't possible here, nor really is random assignment, because once somebody defects, you didn't, you didn't get to take all 20 defectors and say, okay, half of you are going to become activists and half of you are not going to become activists, and then I want to study how that works. Again, this particular research question doesn't have the ability for random selection or random assignment, but it's still worth studying, right? So while I tell you the hallmark and the ideal and the, the, gold, the gold standard, if you will, is random selection and random assignment, there are exceptions. Right? There, are, there are times when you'll have to study something that doesn't have that. Maybe something with random selection that doesn't have random assignment. So if you wanted to study whether or not ch gender stereotypes existed in children's games and whether or not those gender stereotypes changed over time in a selection of children's games, you might say take a whole bunch of games available in 1960 <clears throat> and then a whole bunch of games available in 1980 and another set of... Uh, uh, games available in the year 2000, and then finally a fourth set in the year 2020. And so you go and you get a listing of all the games that were there during that particular year, and you randomly select which ones you're going to look at. Right? That way there's no bias, you're not picking the, the boys games versus the girls games, or the neutral games, or the sports games, or the whatever, you just randomly select. Great, that's perfect, that should represent the sample, or that should represent the larger population of games that were available in that year. So you do that for each set of years. 
Now, you want to see whether or not there's gender stereotypes in them, so you have to go look at them and try and code for things. So you might look at this old older picture of a battleship box from Milton Bradley, and know it's pretty cool, the, the dad's sitting there playing with his son. He's, he says, it's a hit, because his son clearly just sank his battleship. So the boys are, are in here playing a, a fine battleship game. What are the girls doing at the time? Well, you can see mom and daughter are back there doing dishes. This is a definite gender stereotype built into the advertising graphic on the front of the Battleship game. I'm not saying don't play Battleship. They've changed the, the cover here, so give them a little bit of credit. But you could not randomly assign which game was going to have gender stereotypes and which game was not going to have gender stereotypes. That's, that's not possible in this sort of study. You can randomly select, but you can't engage in random assignment. Still worth studying. Okay, so just wanted to point that out just so that you didn't think I was so, so on such a high horse that I didn't think any of these other research areas that couldn't accomplish those tasks weren't feasible or, or important to, to research. They most certainly are. In fact, here, let's watch a quick, it's like about five minute video, um, summing up a little bit of what I just said about types of sampling and some of the risks and rewards associated with each of those types. Recall that our population refers to the group of things that we want information about and a sample refers to part of the population that we take out to examine and draw conclusions from. In this video, we will be looking at the different methods of obtaining a sample. But first, let's look at the types of biased samples. Biased samples occur when one or more parts of the population are favored over others. The two types of biased samples include the convenience sample and the voluntary response sample. A convenience sample only includes people who are easy to reach. If this is our population, and a researcher comes along to interview people, then he would only talk to the people that are closer to him to be part of the sample. This is a biased sampling method, because not everyone in the population has an equal chance of being part of the sample. Only people that are of convenience to the researcher will be interviewed. Now a voluntary response sample consists of people that have chosen to include themselves in the sample. So the researcher, lets people come to him. This is a biased sampling method because people with a strong interest for the survey topic are the ones who are most likely to respond, whereas the people who don't feel as strongly about the topic may not even care to respond. Remember that a good sample is one that is representative of the entire population, and it gives each thing an equal chance of being chosen. When you have these conditions, you have what is known as an unbiased sample. We will be looking at three different types, stratified random sampling, multi-stage sampling, and simple random sampling. The most basic type of sampling is the simple random sample, also known as an SRS. Since an SRS is unbiased, each individual has an equal chance of being chosen to be surveyed, in other words, to be part of the sample. You can think of an SRS as putting names into a hat and selecting N of them. So if I wanted a sample size of 6, I would select 6 papers and come up to the randomly chosen people to interview them. For a stratified random sample, we take the population and we divide it into something called a strata. Strata refers to the groups of similar people. Within each stratum, we take an SRS and combine the SRSs to get the full sample. For example, we could take an SRS of 2 people from each group so that we get the total of 6 people. A stratified random sample is good for making sure that whoever is administering the sample gets in contact with each kind of group. The last type of sampling is called multi-stage sampling. For multi-stage sampling, we use a combination of two or more simple random samples. As the name suggests, multi-stage sampling means you have to go through different stages to find where your sample comes from. For example, if we have three groups, Stage 1 could be selecting which group will be picked using an SRS. Let's say that I picked out group 1. Then that means I would only look at group 1. Then for stage 2, I would do another SRS to get the 6 random people. We go through different stages of simple random samples to get the actual sample, and this is why this is called multi-stage sampling. I'd like to point out that instead of putting names in a hat, there's another way to pick things randomly. We can use something called the random digits table. The random digits table consists of a long string of random numbers, and it can help us do an SRS. To use it, I would first have to label each member of the population with a number. We have 30 people in this population, so I will label each person from 1 to 30. 
Notice how I have written 0, 1 instead of just 1. Doing this helps us use the random digits table. Since each label has two digits, we will read the string of numbers two digits at a time. So let's say I want a sample size of 4. We will use the random digits table to randomly select 4 people. The first number on the table is 19, so person 19 will be part of the sample. The second number is 22, so person 22 will be part of the sample. The third number is 39, but our sample size doesn't go up to 39, so we will ignore it. We will also ignore 50 and 34, but we will keep number 5. We will also ignore 75, 62, and 87, but we will keep number 13. As a result, these are the people we would survey. Alright, that's it. We are done. Um, video 2 coming right at you. Alright, cheers.